Yeah, good morning, everybody. We're going to read scripture here in just a second, but before we do, uh, yeah, I just got to let you know uh, I'm doing something here for uh, for the first time in uh, my 12, 13 years of preaching ministry, and that is that uh, I'm shutting down a sermon series that I had planned uh, to do here through the season of Advent, uh, and just a brief word of explanation about that. I remember last week I mentioned that, you know, part of what Advent is, is the season where we are looking forward in hope to all that is yet to come, hence a lot of the music that we've, we've sung in worship this morning. And we talked about how, you know, Advent reminds us as well, too, that our calling as God's people in the here and now is not to reach and grab and pull heaven into the present for ourselves, but rather our job is to wait faithfully in a yet yearning and broken world. And as part of that waiting faithfully, we are called to wait alongside those who in life sometimes have to suffer the heavier burdens of a dark and broken creation, things like loneliness or despair and depression or grief or unjust suffering. Okay? And, and I mentioned to you last week, the goal of the sermon series was not to, uh, the plan was anyway, not to address or, or to give to you all that the Bible has to say about loneliness or despair or, you know, and things, but rather to use passages of Scripture to remind us of our calling as God's people that God's heart bends towards those people who suffer, and thus we ought to have eyes that are open, hearts that are soft towards them, and hands ready to serve uh, them in their time of need. But what I really became um, burdened by was knowing that there are many in our congregation who do suffer some of those things very acutely and who long for deep consoling and answers from the scripture in relation to those things. And so I knew, or I was starting to feel the pressure that to preach sermons that mention those things but really don't address them head on but just kind of touch on them in passing as I'm encouraging all the rest of us to walk. I was burdened uh, and convicted that that might actually wind up being more discouraging for those individuals than encouraging or hope-inspiring, which is the very antithesis of what uh, Advent is, is supposed to do. Uh, and maybe that's even speaking a little bit uh, selfishly of my own uh, you know, experience in, in walking some of those roads myself and having times of wrestling with God and yearning for deep and not just quick, trite, biblical answers but the rich and complex answers the scriptures give. And anyway, which is all to say, uh, come yesterday, <laughs> about 11 o'clock in the morning, as I was still wrestling through this and was not at all at peace uh, about a, uh, a sermon series, I uh, just made the call to, to shut that one down, to shut that series down. Not because I think that the call is any less urgent for us to walk alongside them, or not at all because I don't want to have those conversations about what the Bible has to say about loneliness and despair and grief and suffering. Uh, I was just not confident that the path we were going to tackle that was going to do that well. And I think the spirit was um, just not leaving me at peace about that. And so I um, decided to put that down for the time being. But with the open invitation, particularly to those of, those of you who are struggling in those areas, because we're not dressing it here, it does in no way mean I have no interest in talking about that. I very much do, and I think the scripture has a lot to say about those particular issues, and the door is always open to come have that conversation. Um, so please feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, instead, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to stick with the theme of Advent, um, but we are going to... Uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna take a more maybe a little bit more traditional approach to it. Um, actually, uh, this is the second Sunday of Advent, and all through and throughout the history of the church, uh, churches have taken the second Sunday of Advent to address the theme of preparation. And actually, today all around the world, there's going to be a variety, a large number of churches, myriad of churches that will be gathering together talking about the theme of preparation. Maybe they'll be in Malachi three. You know, where the prophet says, I will send my messenger ahead of me who will prepare the way for the Lord. Or maybe they'll be looking at John the Baptist as the one to prepare the way. Uh, we're actually going to use Isaiah uh, 51 and 52 this morning uh, to talk about that theme of preparation. And before we do that, I'll just preface it by saying this, just to get us in the frame of mind. You know, I would imagine as it's a holiday season, some of you will be having holiday gatherings, be inviting friends and family 
loved ones, church people over for get togethers this afternoon. We're having uh, some of the uh, the families who uh, represented the different countries at the international festival. We invited them over for uh, a dinner this evening, right? And so today, as they're coming, like today is going to be largely a day of preparation for that. Make sure Jeffrey's little toy trash trucks are not on the ground so anybody trips and has a major fall. Or, you know, make sure that the kibasi is good and grilled up and the onions and the sauerkraut are all ready to go and things like that. Right? Today's going to be a preparation. If you're hosting a holiday get-together, you're adding into the holiday madness <laughs> probably a time of preparation where you're going to get the house ready, the food prepared, things ready to go. And you would think, especially if you had somebody coming who was of deep significance to you, somebody that you looked up to, that you admired, that you held in great esteem, or that you just very much treasured in your life, all the more as they were coming, you would be preparing and getting ready. And that's kind of the theme of of the second Sunday in Advent, that as we are looking forward to and awaiting with eager anticipation the return of the King who will restore all things, there has been this recognition throughout the history of the church to take time to use this season well, to clean house in our own hearts and lives and to prepare and to give ourselves to the business of preparing. And so that's what we're going to look at today. I invite you to stand with me and grab your Bibles if you have them to Isaiah 51 and 52. I'm going to begin reading in verse 17 of Isaiah 51. And I'm going to read down uh, through verse 12 of Isaiah 52. Uh, skipping over three verses uh, in chapter 52, verses 3 through 6. So I'll, I'll lead you through that. So Isaiah 51, verse 17, the prophet writes, Wake yourselves, wake yourselves. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. There is none to guide her. Among all the sons she has born, there is none to take her by the hand. And among all the sons she has brought up, these two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Again, who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in a net. They are full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. But therefore, hear this, you who are afflicted, you who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand that cup of staggering, a bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. And I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, bow down that we may pass over you. And you have made your back like the ground and like the street for them to pass over. So awake, awake, and put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O daughter, captive of Zion. And then in verse 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace and who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. So break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, and go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. For you shall not go out in haste. You shall not go in flight. For the Lord will go before you. And the God of Israel will be your rear guard. This is the reading of God's word to us, and we pray that the Spirit would give us eyes to see it clearly, uh, ears to hear, and hearts that are soft and willing to follow. You may be seated. All right, so let's let's imagine uh, you're a young person here today, teenagers, and you're sitting at the lunch table, 
uh, at school with, you know, with your friends or whoever, and you just happen to sit there, and as you're eating your, your lunch, you happen to look over, and you catch out of the corner, right? there's, there's the table with all the cool kids, or all the popular kids. <laughs> or, I don't know, maybe your table is the cool and popular kids, in which case this uh, illustration doesn't apply to you. I sat at the table at lunch with a bunch of guys that played chess the whole time, so even though I may have thought it was the cool table, it probably wasn't. <laughs> So let's just say you're there and you happen to look over and you see the table with the cool, you know, all the cool kids, all the popular kids. And just for a brief moment, you entertain thoughts of maybe not envy, but you just, man, it must be nice to be them. Just have everybody looking up to you, admiring you, you know, loving the ground upon which your feet walk, you know, whatever, all this stuff. And man, you know, how nice would it be just to, you know, be at that table, to have that kind of status or whatever. And maybe you... As you're looking at them, you just happen to notice the way they conduct themselves and, you know, the way they, they wear their hair, they, the clothes that they wear, or how they, how they walk or talk or whatever. And you think, you know what, I can do that. And maybe if I did that, maybe, you know, I, you know, I might get a seat at the cool kids table or whatever. And so you, you know, you, you change the way you do your hair, you, you change your clothes, you start to walk. So I don't know how they walk nowadays, but so, anyway. You, so you start to walk a certain way, right? And then, and then... You, you start to notice something else, too. You notice that to be, to be one of the cool kids or the popular people, maybe it means, well, you kind of look down on the people who are not seated at your table. And maybe you talk about them behind their back, and maybe you, you, you jeer at them, or you, you know, say some snide things, or you make some little, some little jokes to elevate your status and point out how they are not of you. And, and maybe you remember from youth group, or you remember from conversations around the dinner table that... Uh, that that as followers of Jesus, we don't do that. That instead, we look out for the, the weak and the lowly, or we look out for those who are outcast, or who are cast aside by, overlooked by society. We, we don't do that. But you think, but that's not going to get me anywhere <laughs> in this lunchroom. It's not going to get me to the cool table if I act like that. Or maybe you're an adult here, right, and you're looking out at the world and your status, and you're looking out at the affairs and the status of culture, and you find yourself lamenting. You find yourself lamenting the direction that you see the world going with their rejection of traditional morals and traditional values, or with what seems the curtailing of individual liberties, or maybe just the way the economy is going, any of all these things, and you're just, you're just fearful of the world that your kids are going to inherit. And you can't help but notice that it's the people who climb the rungs of power. And the people who are fiercely able to hold on to power that seem to be the movers and shakers of this culture and seem to shape, set the direction that this world is going to go. And you think, man, if I could just get a little bit of power, if I could hold, get into that position, maybe I could make a difference. And of course you can't help but notice that Part of playing that game and holding on to powers, you've got to be ruthless towards your opponents. And you have to take, you know, nothing from nobody. And maybe every now and then you've got to bend the truth just a little bit to fit your narrative to keep people. You've got to do whatever it takes to fiercely hold on to this position of power. And meanwhile, you remember, you know, the words of Jesus who says, Blessed are the meek, and blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn and who suffer for righteousness' sake. Or when you're, you know... Uh, who, who encourages his people to love your enemies and bless those who persecute you. And you think, okay, that sounds all nice and well, but that is not the way the world works. That's not what's going to shape our culture and move things forward. At least it doesn't seem that way. All of this, this is a little bit of the backdrop, the scene into which this word of hope and encouragement and challenge comes. Okay, this, this passage is being written to a group of Israelites, the idea being that they are in exile, meaning that their homeland has been overrun by the mighty Babylonians. And as ruthless empires did that day, they come in, they decimate the place, they level your cities, and they carry you off into exile. Maybe taking you off into exile to be their servants or their slaves, or maybe carrying you off to get you to you know, assimilate or integrate into Babylonian culture to intermarry with Babylonian wives or whatever. This is the way that cultures, you know, the empires back then would utterly decimate any rival cultures in the area that would take over and it would just kind of get you to try to assimilate into them. And maybe, after a few years, 
maybe a few decades of being in exile in Babylon, you start to look around, you notice mighty Babylon with its incredible cities and its military power and might and all of its wealth that it seems to be accumulating. And you start to think, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's how the world works. And that's how you get, a, get something out of life. And this is what it's all about. And so maybe you start to think, look, if I ever want to make something of my life or make something for my kid's life, that's the game I got to play. Maybe you remember what it means to be an Israelite and a follower and a worshiper of Yahweh, but that doesn't seem to get you anywhere. Look at what the Babylonians have. Look what their gods have gotten for them. This is the name of the game. And so it's into that that Isaiah 51 and 52 speaks. And we're going to look at it, uh, we're going to break it up in the three sets of double commands that you get. Uh, verse 17, it's wake up, awake. And it's the same thing again uh, in verse 1 of chapter 52. Awake, awake. Uh, or uh, then the last one uh, there in verse 11 of chapter 52, depart, depart, go out from there. Okay? So first of all, wake up, wake up, O Israel. You, as the text says, who have drunk the cup, the bowl of God's wrath. If you know your Bible, you know that that's a common image of the wrath of God, this image of a, you know, picture like it's a tall glass of a really stiff cup of wine or a hard liquor or whatever, right? Or this bowl of this stuff that you are made to drink. And as you wade into it, you start drinking it a little bit. Okay, fine, no problem here. You get halfway down and uh, all of a sudden your, your, your head's getting dizzy and your, your words are getting a little bit slurred. You drink another third of the way down and now all of a sudden you can't see straight and you're having a hard time walking a straight line. You drink it all the way down to the end and it just levels you out and you are passed out, humiliated, utterly incapacitated on the floor. That's, that's sort of the picture here. Because people have been made to drink the cup, the bowl of God's wrath all the way down to the very dregs and it has laid them to waste. The interesting thing here is I think this is a word of encouragement <laughs> to the Israelites. And you say, how in the world is this a word of encouragement? Isaiah, you have a fine, you have some poor bedside manner if you think this is in any way encouraging to us. But here's the thing, right? If you're in exile in Babylon, and the question comes up, why am I in exile? Why am I in Babylon? The common perception probably was... Well, I'll tell you why I'm exiled, because the Babylonians, with their massive military regiment and all their power and their wealth and their might, they bested us. Or, it might also be in Babylon too, because the Babylonian gods have bested our God. So, here, what the prophet's saying is, well, hold on a second, no, no that, that's not why you're in exile. I'll tell you why you're in exile. You're in exile because you have defiled my land. You became an adulterous people. And you went out and you played the whore with all the surrounding nations and the surrounding gods. And you brought those gods into my land, into your homes, into my temple. And you bowed down and worshipped to those gods. And not only that, but you did detestable things to appease those gods. <laughs> you know, not only did you do this, but you, you filled my land with injustice. And you, you cared nothing about the poor. You didn't take up the cause of the widows or the orphans. You mistreated the sojourners and the strangers among you. You know that's not me, and I told you how to rat, but you've filled my land with idolatry and injustice. And so here's why you're in exile. When the time came, when the time was right, and Babylonian was ready to write, I withdrew my protection. And I allowed them to come in and to purge and to purify my land and to carry you off into exile as a result of my judgment. I wasn't bested by any Babylonian gods. I wasn't bested by any Babylonian military regiment. I, you are receiving my judgment. Okay, but here's the thing. This was never eternal. It was never my intention to fully abandon you or to leave you in your desperate situation. And that cup has been drank, and now I'm going to return. And now I'm going to restore you, and now I'm going to plead your cause, and I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to take the cup out of your hand, and I'm going to place it in the hand of your oppressor, the ones who marched all over you while you were face down in the dirt. When you, as the text says, were like a, a widow 
who had no sons, as the text says, to care for her, to, to look after you, to help you in your time of distress. I'm telling you, I am coming. I'm taking that cup from you, putting it in the cup of your oppressors, and I'm going to deliver you. So wake up. We're in 52, uh, sorry, uh, verse 1. Awake, awake, and put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. <laughs> For some reason, I had Joe Worrell in mind as I was thinking over these verses yesterday. Uh, Joe Worrell, if you know, uh, has been in quarantine his first Sunday back in, in what, two weeks, two or three weeks here. And if you know Joe, Joe I don't think the guy sleeps. He doesn't stop for nothing. He's always on the go. He's always doing some project. He's always helping somebody out. He's always building something or taking somebody somewhere or whatever, right? Except when he's in quarantine, right? And then he's laid out. And, I, and, and rumor has it, it might have been the guy sitting next to you, that maybe he was starting to insinuate that over those two weeks, Joe was sort of just letting himself go a little bit. Rumor has it he had some facial hair, a, a little beard brewing there. So I had this picture of Joe just sitting on the couch with a bowl of potato chips and his long hair, just watching ESPN for two weeks. I don't know if that's the case. I'm sure it wasn't. Joe probably uh, finished his whole first floor in, in, in two weeks with quarantine. Anyway, but that's the picture I have. And so here it is now. You're, you're coming up to the end of your quarantine. The two weeks is over. You're about to be delivered. You're about to reenter the land of the living, right? So get up. <laughs> Awake, uh, put on your strength, put on your, your beautiful garments again, kick the dust off of you. Let's go, because God is coming. And so then the encouragement begins, how beautiful are the feet? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who bring gospel to the people and publish declarations of peace. And publish news of coming joy and salvation. Who publish news of salvation to you. Your watchmen, your sentinels. The ones who stand at the gates. And they're the ones who are to watch out for either threats or enemies. Or watch out for good and encouraging tidings. Are coming back reporting incredible news. That God is returning to Zion. And here's the great news. That your God reigns, the text says. And I would want to stress here the emphasis on your God reigns. Again, because right, we, we have the vantage, we have the privilege of looking into the heavens from the vantage point of the New Testament where we know pretty clearly that there is no other God but the true God. It seems to be the, the clear pers perspective of the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, that wasn't clear revelation yet. They weren't so clear on that, where more of the perspective was, well, there's the gods of Israel, and there's the gods of the Babylonians, and there's the gods of the Egyptians, the gods of the Assyrians. So here's the great word of encouragement. Do you understand? Your God reigns. Your God controls the affairs of history. Your God determines the fate of you, his people. This God who, by the way, has taken the cup of his wrath away from you now and is coming and is returning to you to restore you. So wake up. Awake. Put on your strength. Put on your beautiful garments. Kick the dust off. And then here's the last command. command double, double set of commands. Depart. Depart. Uh, actually, this is a word of anticipation. It's not exactly time to depart just yet, so it's more like a prophetic word of anticipation. It's more prepare for departure. Get ready to depart. Get ready to go out from her. Touch no unclean thing as you do. Purify yourself, it says. And that line right there, that purify yourself, that is the indicator line that what we're talking about here is departing it's more than just departing a physical location. The command here is more, hey, to prepare to depart a place, Babylonian the place, to go home to Israel the place. This purify yourself means that this is a call to purify yourself, to, to depart, to come out of the whole Babylonian way of life. The whole Babylonian system and structure, the whole dominant view of life and reality that was a part of Babylon, that maybe you had become accustomed to, that maybe you had become acclimated to, or maybe you had begun to think, this is the name of the game, and this is how you play the game. Here's the call. Depart. Get out of that. Touch no unclean thing as you do. Purify yourself. 
in preparation for this great salvation that is coming. You know, and, and I would say real quick, so that, that command, to me, seems like the more challenging one. Like, wake up, you know, wipe the you know, dust off your eyes or whatever so you can see clearly the coming salvation. Look to the east, look for the... Dave, okay, that's great. Yeah, I can do that. I can build my anticipation. I can look with eager hope for the day of God's salvation. But this depart, get out, touch no unclean thing, purify yourself, rid yourself of that whole way of life, that whole way of thinking, that whole mentality, that whole perspective. Well, now that, that requires confidence and faith that the words of the prophet are true, right? Because as I look around... It certainly seems like the Babylonians have figured this thing out. It certainly seems like the Babylonian gods are providing for them everything that they are wanting. So to tell me to leave all that behind, to walk out on that, to purify myself, that requires this faith that indeed it is my God, our God, who reigns and who is leading us home, leading us back to be his true and purified people. actually like, just in, in closing here, or on this part of it anyway, I, I like this final, uh, final word of encouragement here where the text says that uh, you shall not go out in haste and you shall not go out in flight for the Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your, be your rear guard. Right? As you're going, you don't have to run with panic and you don't have to run fearful or looking over your shoulder at the enemies because God's out in, for, in front of you clearing out your enemies and God is behind you being your rear guard. And I imagine why this was so, it could have been so powerful for the Israelites is because they probably remember hearing stories of when their forefathers had to leave another empire. Right? The empire of Egypt. And that time when they had to leave, they had to leave rather quickly. So much so they couldn't let the leaven rise in the bread, right? So you had to take the unleavened bread. That's why year after year we have the celebration of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread because we remember our ancestors who had to flee out of Egypt. You know, not letting the leaven rise up in the bread. Why? Because that permission to leave was probably a tenuous permission and sure enough they were going to be hot on their tail once they got outside the city gates. But this time, none of that. This victory of God is going to be so thorough, so, so complete. You don't need to leave in fear and panic and haste. God's going to clear out your enemies. He's going to be your rear God behind you calmly. <laughs> you can just walk right out of there. All right, so there's, there it is. There's, there's the message of the prophet to the people of Israel. And again, what is Advent where it's God's people today? We take our stand with the people of, of God all throughout the ages, and we look forward with eager anticipation to the future day of salvation and what God is going to do. And so I think that this message also just has a a a few quick things, powerful words of encouragement or reminder to us. You know, I'll first of all mention that there's some differences in our situation and this situation. Uh, Perhaps the most significant one being is that there's no cup anymore. There's no cup of God's wrath. That's been drank, swallowed to the full, emptied out completely. The cup of God's wrath has been totally dissolved when the Son of God, Jesus Christ, chose to leave the comforts and the glories of heaven and exile himself into a sin-ridden, broken creation so that he might stand alongside helpless sinners in their time of distress. And so that he might, in his life and in his death, suffer what they deserve to suffer. That cup of God's wrath was drained out when, you know, one night Jesus, staggering out of anxiety and fear of the horror that was yet to come, fell to his knees, sweat drops of blood, cried out to his father, Father, please, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And because Christ was willing to suffer that wrath of God unto death, drain the cup of God's wrath. There is no cup left for God's people to to drink anymore. Actually, there's no cup of God's wrath for God's people to drink anymore. All that's left is the cup of the new covenant that we take and we celebrate and we remember together, right? That because God's wrath has been emptied out, because Christ has stood in our place and suffered what we deserve, now all we drink is this cup of the new covenant 
of this new eternal unshaking relationship with God the Father through Christ and his spirit. So that situation is a little bit different. Another little difference about the situation is that we have no real reason to look forward with even the slightest measure of doubt is that will, will God prevail over his enemies? Right, because we're also on the back end of the resurrection. Right, we're on the back end of when the, 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 the powers of sin and death and Satan itself did their worst to Christ and literally plunged him into the pits of death. But three days later, Jesus departed the tomb. He got out and walked out of the tomb. And he didn't do it in haste. You know, running for his life, fearing that the enemies of God were going to be hot on his tail. No, he knew that it was such a climactic defeat, such a climactic victory over the enemies of God had just taken place that I imagine he just walked out casually. Right, so we don't doubt for a moment because we know that if Jesus has already conquered the powers of sin and death and Satan, all the powers of hell itself, then for sure those powers have no effect, no eternal effect over us for whom God has and Christ has pledged himself to. Right? But what is similar is that we, we stand with the Israelites and we look forward to this great day of salvation that is yet to come. And we look forward to the day when peace, full and final, consummate peace, will be published throughout all of God's creation. We look forward to the day when joy and happiness will be fully published abroad in all of God's creation. We look forward to that great day of final salvation where there is no thing, nothing that would, even live, lead, that would even lead to a doubt that our God reigns, right? And so as we wait for that, it's our job to awake, to wake up, to be alert, and to prepare ourselves for that coming kingdom. It's actually the Apostle Paul who says in uh, Romans 13, you know the time. You know that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than even when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Right? This is Paul saying, you know the day of salvation is near at hand. The, 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 the day has come. Night is far gone. So let's prepare ourselves. Let's put off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. You know, and, and maybe you could say to Paul, you know, hey, Paul, I can't help but notice in, in a lot of your writings that it seemed like you were expecting the Lord to return at some point during your lifetime. Uh, well, so here it is 2,000 years later, and for whatever reason, the time hasn't been right, the job hasn't been done, and the Lord hasn't returned. So you know what, Paul, you probably could have taken it easy just a little bit more and laid back on some of your, you know, whatever. Or you could look at Paul and you could say, well, whether he had a right or, or, or wrong concept of exactly when the Lord was going to return, yet he lived and he encouraged the church to live in the proper way. To live as if the Lord of history, the Lord of creation, in his own time, in his own way, without warning, without notice, could, determine, could decide at any time, the time is fulfilled, the job is done, and I'm going to return. And so let's be ready. Let's be awake. Let's put off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. He gets it a little bit more specifically there. He says avoid any kind of sexual immorality, this raw gratification of brute desires of the flesh. He says have nothing to do anymore with quarrels and strife or with jealousy and envy. He says but put on Christ. That's what it means to be put on the armor of light. Put on Jesus Christ. This Jesus who had no concern to fit in with the dominant reality all around him or the dominant systems of the day. This is Jesus who had no consideration for the flesh, but was willing to lay the flesh fully aside in love for sinners that he came to serve. Put on this Jesus who had mercy on the poor and compassion on the sick. Put on this Jesus who saw the lowly and whose heart bent towards the outcast, who went to them with love and compassion and tender mercy. Put on this Jesus who for his who whole life, from beginning to end, and everything that he did, he always lived advancing the kingdom of God. He always lived as a servant, not to his own kingdoms, but as a servant to the kingdom of his heavenly Father. This is what it means for Paul to prepare yourself, to get ready, live as the children of the light, put on Christ. And it's the calling of the church. 
That's what it means to prepare. And in this Advent season where we are looking forward, uh, this is the Advent encouragement to prepare yourself. Take inventory. Take notice of your own heart and life. Are you prepared? Should the king, without warning, without notice, decide that the time is fulfilled, the job is done, it's time to return, are you ready? Basically, there's two questions I would leave you with this morning, and that's the first one. If the king would decide that the time is fulfilled, the job is done, and without warning and without notice, decide to come and return and restore all things, are you ready? Have you prepared yourself? Have you sufficiently lived your life as best as you are able by the Spirit's help in preparation for that day? And the second question that I'll just leave you with to think about is related to that. Is there anything that you need to depart from in your life? Is there anything you need to come out of? And any unclean that you need to stop putting your hands on? Is there anything... that you need to purify yourself, again, by the Spirit's help. Is there anything that you need to depart, come out from, get your hands off of, purify yourself from? Right? Is there any participation in the, I don't know, the, the dominant view of reality out there or the dominant systems and structures or the dominant American way of life that you know in your heart maybe is not exactly of the kingdom of Christ? Is there anything you need to depart from that and come out from that in preparation for the king? Is there any foreign God that you have allowed to have a position of prominence maybe in your heart, a God of comfort, a God of material prosperity, a God of personal vindication? Is there any false worship going on in your heart that you need to come out of and leave behind so that Christ can take his proper place as Lord of your heart? Is there any place of fear that you need to leave behind and come home in faith, trusting that the king, your king is Lord of history and your king will complete the job. Is there any strife? Is there any bitterness? Is there any envy? Is there any jealousy? Is there any raw gratification of the desires of the flesh that by the Spirit's help you need to get your hands off of, you need to walk out of, you need to depart because your king is coming and it's our job to prepare and be ready. Those are the two questions I would leave you with, the questions the prophets have given to God's people, and that's our job. We wait with eager anticipation, and during the Advent season, we take advantage of this season as a time to prepare, to take inventory of our hearts and lives, to take notice, is there anything that we need to come out of, get our hands off of, walk away from? Is there any place where we need to, by the Spirit's help, more fully put on Christ so that we may live more faithfully in service to him and so that a dying world might see more clearly his light until the day that he comes. We pray that the Spirit would do that in his church for his honor and glory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.